Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'm going to be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's armored missile vehicle, the 1983 Wolverine and its driver, Covergirl. Both Covergirl and the Wolverine make their first comic book appearance in the old mobile comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 16. However, Covergirl makes her first cartoon appearance in the 1983 five-part miniseries G.I. Joe A Real American Hero, better known as The Mass Device, in Part 2, but the Wolverine makes its first appearance in Part 3. Now, as you might be aware, the cartoon model for Covergirl was, at first, kind of off, as she had long blonde hair in that. Now, as you can see by the box art, she actually has short auburn hair. Now, it's debatable as to whether this was an animation mistake on Sumbo Animation's part, because a lot of collectors have noted that with the short reddish-brown hair, she looks a lot like Scarlet, and this may have been uh, Sumbo's animation's attempt at making her look distinctly different, but it might also be that Sumbo Animation got an earlier design for CoverGirl than what was eventually released in toy form. Remember that uh, Sumbo Animation actually did get um, pre-production artwork and designs um, from Hasbro quite a number of months and sometimes even a whole year before the toy actually went into actual production. Well, all that is debatable because in the 1984 Revenge of Cobra five-part miniseries, her appearance in cartoon form was changed to uh, something a little bit closer to the toy. Instead of giving this vehicle an acronym, Hasbro gave it a nickname, the Wolverine. And I think that's very appropriate, as Wolverines, the actual animal, are, are just about dog size, but they have really big paws with very prominent uh, claws sticking out from those paws. And I think that, that actually describes the look of this particular armored missile vehicle very closely. The 1983 Wolverine is a relatively simple vehicle. You won't get a more sophisticated vehicle from this price range until about 1984 and upwards. But it has a spot for one single driver, and you can see how deeply she's sitting into that little cockpit area. She is a full three and three quarter inch figure, in fact. And you can see how the seat was molded in there, but there's no control panel sculpted in, unfortunately. It does have a removable engine cover to show off some engine detail. A nice added touch. On the engine cover itself, you can see some molded in bags. A lot of people call these sleeping bags, but I generally tend to think of these as uh, tarps to put over the entire vehicle just to uh, have it hidden from the elements, as well as maybe for ambush. At this price point, the $10 price point back in 1983 and 1984, we don't have actual rolling treads. They are actually just fake. And we're actually rolling on these little dummy wheels underneath. And it rolls relatively well. It's not obstructed in any way. You notice that the Wolverine actually does have a universal tow hook. But in addition to that, it also has these tow cleats. Not quite sure why we have these four tow cleats. You have two on the back and two on the front here. In addition to the universal tow hook, that's, uh, that's a very odd choice there. The real star of the Wolverine armored missile vehicle is, of course, the missile pods. And it has on a rotating turret here. Rotate 360 degrees, and the actual missile boxes raise and lower in tandem. As a matter of fact, there's a little bit of a sculpted detail right there, which kind of knocks against the edge of one of the boxes, preventing it from going a full through 180 degrees, but you can actually kind of finagle it over that. I don't know why you would want to uh, flip it all the way around like that, but it's possible if you kind of uh, force it a little bit. And of course we have six missiles in each of the two boxes making for 12 altogether. The missiles themselves are 
Well, they're they're kind of crude. They're not they're not really totally um, totally detailed out. And you can see that each one of these has its own individual number. So if you're really conscious about the stickers and stuff like that, uh, and you can't find one which has all of the proper numbered stickers for all 12 of the missiles, uh, you might want to hit the repo label circuit there. It's really funny because um, the actual rockets themselves are kind of rubbery, in fact. I mean, mine have gone kind of stiff over the years, but I remember when I first got this, the, um, the missiles were kind of rubbery. And on top of that, when you're putting stickers on a curved and rubbery surface, they really don't stay on very well. I remember having to re-glue these a number of times. And, of course, we get to the bane of all collectors who are trying to assemble a complete Wolverine. And that is the tow cable. Oh my goodness, this thing is probably the most fragile thing in all the G.I. Joe universe. It is extremely thin. And yes, it is removable. It is meant to be removable, in fact. We have a peg here for the end loop, and a peg here for the start loop. And, well, you saw that I didn't have these um, both on either side because, well, I can't. I don't know if it was like this to begin with or if it shrunk over the years. But as you can see with the one loop on there, the other loop does not does not go to the end peg. It just it can't stretch that way. With these knobs in the middle, these are great breaking points. The finely detailed, almost rope-like sculpt to the very thin plastic is also a breaking point as well. It's really very rare to find a Wolverine with the cable still attached. As a matter of fact, this is a very light gray, which matches the missiles. If it's slightly darker than this, then it might have come from the 1989 Lynx, the Slaughter's Marauders Lynx, which shared the bottom portion of the Wolverine's mold. And if it's like, if it's really, really dark gray, almost black, then it might have come from the 1985 Mahler MBT, which didn't share the mold, but it had for some strange reason, gave it a slightly longer, um, I believe, tow hook. I'd say the Wolverine surface detailing is really good. You can see that they've actually made these grip pads here for the figure to actually walk up from the front here and into the cockpit. A very nice little detail that they didn't really have to put in there. But there's a lot of nice little surface detail all around the vehicle. And even some underneath it as well. There's a lot of like hollow portions as well. And it's relatively uh, flat. But there's still detail which, again, they didn't really have to put in there. But they did. I do have to say that size-wise, Wolverine actually kind of looks bigger than it really is. You do have to understand that this thing was at the $10 price point. So it's not really going to be that much bigger than, let's say, a vamp from either the previous year or from the same year. They're both relatively the same size, I would say volume-wise. Another easy matchup is, of course, pitting it against the 1983 His Tank. Again, the His Tank has more height on here, but it's very narrow compared to the very wide Wolverine. These things were both matched up in the commercials for the toys, as well as the initial appearances in the comic books as well. And here's a comparison between the Wolverine and the Mobad, released in 1982, 83, and 84 alongside the Wolverine. It is, of course, a much larger vehicle, but it costs twice as much. But you can also see that it shares a lot of the great surface detail which was sculpted onto these vehicles at the time. They definitely look like they're same, from the same fleet at least. This also has the um, like shovels and hammers also molded onto the, here. Non-removable of course, but it's also something that the Wolverine also has as well. 
So just what would the opposite number on the Cobra side be for the Wolverine? Well, I've already mentioned that the commercials and the marketing, as well as the comic books, had already sort of uh, paired up the his tank to be versus the Wolverine. But if you go for another year, in 1984, we also have the Cobra Stinger. With its missile bank, I think it's a very good rival to the multi-missile, but this would certainly be a smaller missile, ground-to-ground -ground missile. While the Wolverine is not directly based on any existing military vehicle, it's easy to point to the M270 MLRS as the basis of the toy design. If you get rid of the M270's front cab and split the large missile box down the middle, it's pretty close. Even the number of missiles both carry is the same. Two groups of six for 12 in total. And now it's time for... Does a modern figure fit it in? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra Footloose figure as an example of a modern figure. Well, he certainly sticks out more than CoverGirl did, or any 3 and 3 quarter inch figure would. But I don't think that he looks terribly bad. Unfortunately, I can't really seem to fold his arms up into there, but that's mostly because of these, the bulky vest that he has. If you have a figure whose arms actually do rest to their sides very well, I think that you could tuck the arms in there as well. And as you can see, with a bit of finagling, it did actually work. It's actually very interesting and very bold of Hasbro to actually make CoverGirl, a female action figure, the driver for the Wolverine. You have to understand that female action figures are not very popular in the very early 80s. Uh, even the Star Wars Princess Leia, uh, as much of an integral character as she is, she wasn't a very popular seller. And prior to her, we have Scarlet, who again, I mean, Hasbro actually has the numbers, and even though they didn't make a lot of Scarlet action figures, like per case, from, you know, as a ratio with the other figures that she was released with, she didn't, she didn't really sell that well either. So armed with that fact, they still wanted to have a female action figure. So how to sell it? Well, stick her in with a really cool vehicle, and that's how you sell it. Ironically, people buy, bought it up. I mean, it is a really cool vehicle, and quite frankly, uh, CoverGirl is a really cool design. We'll get to that in a moment. But think about it. She's actually more popular than this $3 figure, and yet we're paying like $10 for this whole ensemble. It's actually tricking us into buying a female figure. But it's a nice trick, because like I said, it's a cool vehicle and a nice female design. CoverGirl's design is one of the best, in my opinion. In fact, it's actually one of the best female designs because they're not trying to feminize what she's wearing. It just goes along with, you know, her slenderness and female form. But basically, she is wearing the typical tanker's uniform, a beige coverall covered by a brown bomber jacket and long brown boots. And really, that's it. If you put this ensemble on a guy, it wouldn't look like he was wearing female clothes, really. Of course, we do have a female sculpt for, for her. She's very slender, in fact. And while her face isn't, like, super pretty, I mean, it is a small 3 and 3 quarter inch figure. She is wearing lipstick, which is the first time we get that on a female figure. Scarlet, in fact, did not wear lipstick. One interesting thing about the uh, sculpt is what she has on her thighs here. A lot of collectors jokingly refer to this as a calculator. I'm not really sure what this is supposed to be. And she has an empty holster, which is really very unfortunate. It's really very unfortunate that she comes with no accessories at all. A small pistol for... Um, you know, personnel battles, of course, or the Wolverine is really 
really doesn't have any anti-personnel weaponry on it. So it would, would have been nice if she came with a pistol or some machine gun or something. Another very uh, interesting addition would have been maybe a headphones. Uh, kind of like the way Breaker has his, but we, you know, without the, uh, the wire. And of course we have a nice little Easter egg here. With the patch on her arm being from a real military patch. Covergirl's arm patch is based on the 104th Army Infantry design. They were never an army or mobile unit, so the patch design is most likely just there to look cool. You notice that Covergirl has kind of wrinkly upper arms to go along with the wrinkly texture of her bomber jacket. And even though they were probably first designed for her because they looked the best on her, they were actually, they, did, they made their actual first appearance on the swivel arm battle grip version of the 1983 Scarlet, which quite frankly really doesn't go with the rest of her outfit. There's absolutely nothing else that's wrinkled like that on her except for those upper arms. The 1982 version had very smooth arms as well, so I'm not quite sure why they went with this for this figure. And speaking of which, we have the 1984 Baroness who also has the upper arms um, borrowed from Covergirl here. And again, the wrinkle arms don't look quite as bad because she is wearing leather, but it's a tight, smooth leather on the Baroness. So again, if you're really paying attention to it, it looks really very odd. And now I have the 1982-83, 83 and 84 female figures. You can see just how short the Scarlet figure is to Covergirl. Now, according to the file card, Covergirl is an ex supermall and supermalls generally tend to be around six feet tall. So I can totally understand her dwarfing poor old Scarlet here. Of course, uh, the Baroness was actually a fairly tall figure, but she too is not quite as tall as Covergirl. The tallest female figure in the vintage line is, of course, the 1985 Lady J figure. And here is Covergirl alongside her fellow tank driver, Steeler, and her chief rival, the His Tank Driver. Now, as you can see, uh, Steeler got the lion's share of accessories. That's actually very unusual for a driver figure. But it's rather, like I said, it's rather unfortunate that Covergirl doesn't get anything at all. I know some people have complained that Covergirl kind of has a big head, and that is true. I mean, it's a little hard to see um, with this comparison because they are technically wearing helmets. But I think that's what the sculptors were kind of going for. They're going for a much, you know, a fuller head of hair on Covergirl than you would see normally on um, male counterparts because, well, you know, it is the army. They generally tend to have <laughs> buzz cuts or very, um, very shallow cuts to their hair. Whereas I think uh, Covergirl here would be a bit of a fashionista in that case and still wear her hair a little bit, you know, long and full. Between 1985 and 1986, overstock of the Wolverine was available through mail order, but just by itself. The driver, Covergirl, was only ever available through the original retail release in 1983 and 1984. Sadly, Covergirl was never available in the UK Action Force line, despite the fact that two different versions of the Wolverine were released. It was first available as a black and grey SAS vehicle with a unique figure called Hunter. Then it was made as a green and grey vehicle with Rock and Roll, renamed Ton Up. If you're looking for a Wolverine on the aftermarket, I have to say that a near complete uh, version of the Wolverine is fairly easy to find on the aftermarket. It's a relatively sturdy toy, other than the one part which is almost always missing, and that is the tow rope. This thing is almost either completely missing or broken. And what you would pay for the Wolverine, Covergirl, all its missiles, and all the other parts would be equal to what you would pay just for the tow rope alone. So you're looking at a vehicle which is almost twice as much just for adding this one part. I'm sure you can find customs or reproductions of the tow rope out there though.
kind of an exception. And uh, most toe cleats are actually something that you will typically find on. They're not trying to feminize what she's wearing. Whoops. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.